Hey, today we're starting a series um, called the We Believe series. Now, this series is going to take us through all the way to fall, um, all the way up to close to Thanksgiving, We Believe series. And uh, these are statements that are powerful statements in and themselves and by themselves are wonderful and great. But they work even better together with the other ones. Now, you don't have them listed yet. I forgot to get that to you. Um, but if you're ever uh, heading out the hallway, either towards the nursery or this way or coming this way towards the bathrooms, you walk by these statements all the time. And I'm going to remind you what they are. I would rather call these words to live by because I think they're powerful statements that actually can just really change the course of a believer's life. The first one is, we believe Jesus is Lord. The second one is, we believe found people find people. We believe that saved people serve people. We believe you can't do life alone. We believe that growing people change. We believe you can't outgive God. And then I'm adding one to the hallway that's not out there yet, and it came from our series in prayer. We believe prayer is powerful and essential. We need to have one about prayer out there because we believe that and we're living that and we're seeing how God is answering prayer. So those are the statements. This is a series that we're going to be journeying into. And so the prayer series, we spoke on prayer for about four weeks just before today, and that's going to, that's going to qualify as our we believe prayer is powerful and essential part of that. So for the next two weeks, we're going to look at the statement, we believe Jesus is Lord. What does it mean to say when I say Jesus is Lord? What does that mean? Well, what I want to start with is, who is Jesus? Why don't we start there? Because I'm not assuming that everybody has a good understanding of who Jesus is or any at all. Maybe you've heard the name before and you know a little bit of some of the Bible stories, but I want to give you just a quick synopsis of who Jesus is. This isn't a very lengthy one. But it's quick. Jesus is the full representation of the person of God who stepped down from his heavenly glory to live among us in a human body and showed us the way back to God. That's Jesus. Now, a few more details. He was born of the Virgin Mary over 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. He carried out God's kingdom mission, which was to seek and to save those who were lost. That's what Jesus did. He called people to follow him. He taught them. He performed miracles and healings. And at the age of 33, Jesus died on a Roman cross of execution. He was buried in a borrowed tomb, but on the third day, he rose again. He is not dead. He is risen. That's our Jesus that we worshiped here today. That's Jesus. This act of resurrection proved, and by the way, and displayed the power of God in Jesus as the true Son of God and the Savior of the entire world, even though that's not a true world. That's more of a city globe. Jesus is the way, the truth, and help me finish it, the life. That's who he is. It's what he claimed to be, and that's who he is. So there's Jesus. That's who he is. Most of us know about Jesus. Most of us even know Jesus. We've said yes to Jesus in our life, and we're following after him, and you're on a journey of faith and saying yes to him. But what does it mean that Jesus is Lord? Have you ever put together a resume before? Raise your hand if you've put together a resume before. Okay, most of us have, right? Now, for those of you that are unfamiliar with, or it's been a while, a resume is a formal document that a job applicant creates to list his or her qualifications, education, skills, experience, and uh, any title that they may already have had, it backs that up for them. Like, hey, this is what I've done, and this is you know, my title, and this is what backs up that title, and I'm applying for this job, and this is what I'm showing you who I am that hopefully will qualify me for the job that I'm looking for. So it's a resume. It's kind of this, this fancy list. Now, I'm going to give you an example. For example... Um, if I was going to put together a, a resume for the educational system, and I was telling you, my name is Rex, but they call me Professor Baker. That's just for example, okay? I'm not a professor. I'm a pastor. That's a different, but I'm going the professor route. They call me Professor Baker. So let me prove to you through a resume that I deserve that title of Professor Baker. So my example resume would start with my education. Well, I got a Bachelor's of Liberal Studies from the San Francisco State University in 1996 with multiple subject credentials, and I have a Master's in Elementary Education from Capella University and a Doctorate Degree in Leadership for Higher Education. Fancy, right? 
I was a student teacher at San Francisco Elementary for six months in 95, assistant teacher at McKinley Middle School for four years, a teacher at Oaks Children's Center, which I created a therapeutic environment for students with emotional challenges and instituted a behavior modification program to help students with self-destructive behaviors along with teaching individuals basic language and math skills. I was the vice principal of Highland for two years and a college professor of leadership development at Belmont University. That's Belmont University, if I had to make it up. Okay. <laughs> I'm a self-starter, a team player, and here's a list of my references to other highly qualified and reputable professionals that will tell you the exact same thing that I just did. You can call me Professor Baker. Thank you. I, pre <laughs> I convinced him by my resume because I've earned the title. Now, that was all for example. None of that was accurate or true. I just put it all together just for illustration purposes. Now, I don't mind giving somebody an appropriate title if they can show me their resume of how they got that title. And that's kind of what we're doing here. We're talking about Jesus is his name, Lord is his title. So what does it mean when we say Jesus is Lord? What does it mean that he has that title? Now, generally speaking, especially when you're digging into God's word and the Bible and stories, the word Lord, and even today, the word Lord references somebody with authority. If you're going to call them Lord, they're going to have some, some type of authority. They're going to have some type of control. They're going to have some type of power over others or, or over a region. So we call them Lord. It's a title that's given to somebody with that authority, control, or power. To say that someone is Lord is to consider that person to be somewhat of a master, somewhat of a ruler over something. Now, in Jesus' day, the word or the title Lord was often used as a title of respect towards those in authority. Jesus was actually given this title by people around him, Lord. Many people, and, and you look through Scripture, they're giving him the title Lord. By the way, it was given to him freely. He never stood up one day and said, okay, guys, I'm 30 years old. You shall now call me Lord from now henceforth. That's not the way it went. He was given that by his authority that he displayed as the son of God. And some of them didn't even know he was the true son of God, but they're giving him this title of Lord. There's really great events back to back that happen in the gospel of Matthew. If you have your Bible or something that you can pull up a Bible, and I encourage you, look up right with me right now, Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. So Matthew is the first book of the Old Testament. I'm sorry, the New Testament. That was a test. <laughs> Matthew chapter 8. If you went to Mark, you went too far. If you went to Luke, you went even farther. So back it up. Matthew chapter 8. And I want to read two different events that happened back to back where Jesus is called Lord. So Matthew chapter 8. Before we read that, just a quick background on what's going on. Matthew is recording the ministry and the life of Jesus. And right now, up to this point in Matthew 8, right before that, Jesus had begun his ministry. He had begun to heal the sick. He had called disciples to follow him, and they were doing that. And uh, he was teaching, and he just got done with his famous Sermon on the Mount. It's about two or three chapters long. I think it's two chapters long. I think it's five, six, and seven. So Matthew 8 says this, when Jesus came down from the mountainside, from when he was preaching, large crowds followed him. And that was a normal thing. Verse 2 says, a man with leprosy came and knelt before him. Now let's pause right there and understand what's going on. A man with leprosy came before Jesus. If you had leprosy, it was a gross skin disease where literally your skin's falling off. Like one day you can count to 10, the next morning you wake up, you can only count to nine. It is a horrible disease. That was probably a bad joke. Anyway, he, he lost a finger and he's, okay. It's bad. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to make fun of leprosy because it's a serious thing. We don't see it very much anymore, but back then it was a horrible disease. In fact, you were considered a social outcast if you had this disease and you had to live outside of town and nobody wanted to be around you. And if anybody was around you, they also had a similar disease and you were kind of just left out there until it healed up enough where you could go show yourself to somebody and he'd check you out and he'd say, nope, you're not good. Go back into that dungeon of yours and to come back. Nope, you're not. Yep, you're good. Now you can come back into regular society and be a part of culture. But other than that, stay away. Now this guy comes over to Jesus. He approaches Jesus. That's him. 
Okay, this is the guy with leprosy. And he says, Lord, gives him the title. If you're willing, can you make me clean? Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. By the way, that never would have happened. Jesus said, I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gifts that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. In other words, keep it on the DL, keep it on the down low. Now verse five, the next event. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Now, what's a centurion? Well, a centurion normally is a captain of a of hundred soldiers, a hundred troops. So powerful. He has command over a, a group of guys who are ready for battle. This is the guy. A little different than the leper, right? We have a guy who is outcast, and we have one who has power, and one who has prestige and position, and one who doesn't, nobody wants around. Two different men. So he comes to him, and verse 6, how does he call, who does he call him? Lord. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. So Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, there's the title again, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servants will be healed. My servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, hey, go and, and, and he goes and this one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. Now, pause there, and the next verse is Jesus is basically impressed by this man's faith. Because he's like, no, you don't need to come to my house. Let's just, you can do it from here. Just say the word, and he will be healed. That's the kind of faith he had in Lord Jesus when he's talking to him. And he's telling him, by the way, I've, I've got some authority, but I'm also under authority. It sounds like he had a really good grasp about his position. I love that. He had humility, but he also knew that he had responsibility. And he knew that Jesus, he called him Lord and said, I know you can do this. So Jesus is impressed with his faith. The next few verses, Jesus speaks about heaven and hell. And then verse 13 says, then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. That's cool. That's awesome. Two radically different men, one with leprosy, one seemed to be just fine, Two different needs. The man with leprosy wanted himself healed. The centurion wanted him, his servant healed, who was close to death. But both approached Jesus in the same manner. They needed help, and they called him Lord. The takeaway for me is this. If I were to read those and I would just say, here's the takeaway, let's go home, it would be this. Calling Jesus Lord is an acknowledgement of his power and his position. Because when they came to him, they came to him because they knew he had power. He could do something about the situation to change it around. And so they called him Lord because they knew that he could back that up, or at least they heard he could. So they acknowledge his power and his position. When I call Jesus Lord, I acknowledge his power over all things and his position that nobody else can have as long as I keep him Lord in my life. He's Lord no matter what, by the way. Have you believed in Jesus like that? That you recognize his power and you recognize his position, and so you call him Lord. You know, Jesus' title, as you keep reading through the Gospels, his title is Lord gains in value and gains in power. Every single time he heals somebody, every single time he opens his mouth and speaks words of wisdom, every single time he operated with care and leadership, his bold message and his powerful, purposeful mission, he is title gained in value as Lord. And we have the awesome opportunity to read through that and say, oh yeah, I can see why Jesus is Lord. Look what he was doing in that story. Wow, it's powerful. However, after the resurrection, Jesus went to the cross. He died on that cross. They took him down. They put him in the tomb. And on the third day, he rose again. And after that, the title Lord became much more than just of prestigious honor and respect. It changed in that moment. 
Because saying Jesus is Lord became the way of declaring that Jesus is fully God. He was raised from the dead just like he said he would. In fact, it began with Thomas. Do you remember his nickname, Doubting Thomas? He's in that upper room and he's like, I don't believe it unless I see it. And Jesus is like, okay, you're going to see it. And he saw it. And there Jesus was. And he says, hey, look at, look at my hands. Look at the wounds on my side. It's me. And you know what, his, what he responded with? He said this, my Lord and my God. He recognized that the title he had as Lord because he rose from the dead, just got wound up, and now he is proven to be God. He is Lord. And from that point on, in fact, the apostles' message all through the rest of the New Testament was that Jesus is Lord. It meant Jesus is God. He is fully God. Jesus is who he said he was and who he is. The truth is this. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. You ever boss? You ever have a boss that thinks that they're the final say? You ever have one of those bosses? Yeah, guess what? They actually don't. Jesus does. Now, don't tell them that, okay? Because it might get you in trouble. You can, you're not the boss of me. Jesus is. Uh, really? What, I'm excuse me. What'd you say? <laughs> what department is he? Because he's getting fired too, you know? Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. So when you say Jesus is Lord, that's what you're saying. He has all authority. I mean, he proved it when he walked on water, and then he rose from the grave. Nobody else has ever done that. So he has that title because he has all authority. Jesus is in full control of all matter. He can change matter. He can change DNA. He can change anything he wants at any moment because he has control over all that. He has control over all spiritual forces, and he sustains life. He sustains it. He's a creator of all things. All things were made by him, through him, and for him. Everything comes back to him. You and I were made for him. That's why when we call him Lord, that title is fitting. All things are under his supervision and governing. All things. There's not one thing that's going rogue that Jesus is like, oh, I didn't see that coming. He's not just Lord. In fact, in Revelation, he's given the title Lord of Lords. No matter how big of a, of a title you have on earth, Jesus holds the bigger title. He's Lord of Lords. He's King of Kings. He's first and last. He was then, he is now, and he always will be. That's Jesus. Now, this is great Bible teaching on Jesus as Lord, but we can't stop there. The question has to be made of all of us, do I believe Jesus is Lord? Do I believe Jesus is Lord? Do you personally acknowledge that he is Lord God? Now, why is it important to believe this? Why is it important for you to believe that Jesus is Lord? I want to give you four Just quick reasons why. The first one's kind of, eh, but it works. It's true. Number one, it's good for you. It's good for you. If Jesus is in charge of all things and you trust in him because he's in charge of all things, you know what that does to you? It actually can calm you down a little bit. In fact, it's interesting. There's actual research that shows that your life is better off when you trust in God. They have research that backs it up. They're like, you'll, ha- you'll have more positive outlook, you'll heal, quickly from dis- quick- you'll heal more quickly from disease, um, you can have a longer life, you'll have less stress. I mean, all these things, so it's good for you. It's like good for humanity to recognize that Jesus is in charge and in control because when we recognize that he's in full control, guess what? We can take our hands off the wheel and go, actually, I don't have to stress and worry about this anymore because he's got this. What am I doing? Instead, I'll pray about it. Paul gives us that instruction, right? Hey, stop worrying about it and pray about all things. Give thanks. I mean, it's, give it to the Lord. He's the one who is Lord. So it's good for you. Number reason number one. Number two, number two, the, re- the reason is because you catch up to the reality on earth and in heaven. You just catch up to the reality. Now, our theme verse is actually Philippians 2, 9 through 11. And it reads like this. Therefore, God exalted him, Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, 
that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will acknowledge or confess that Jesus Christ is, help me finish it, Lord, Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That's a really powerful portion of Scripture. He is exalted to the highest, highest place. And that at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow. Every knee at the name of Jesus. Every person, no matter what, no matter who you are, no matter if you have a PhD or a GED, you'll bow before the Lord. You'll take a knee. Whether you have made millions or pennies, it doesn't matter who your dad or grandpa was, who you are going to be, what jobs you've had or not have had. It doesn't matter how much you have in your bank account or don't have in your bank account. Every knee is going to bow. It doesn't matter what culture. Every knee is going to bow before him as Lord. The interesting thing about this reality is that you don't have to believe Jesus is Lord for him to be Lord. He's Lord no matter whether you believe it or not. In fact, some people don't believe Jesus is Lord. But Scripture tells us that every knee will bow. So they will bow before the Lord at one point. So it's really like, hey, you could take a knee now or take a knee later. Because he's Lord now and he'll still be Lord later. By believing in Jesus, you join in on this wonderful truth. You catch up to the reality of that. You set things right in your life. The third reason why it's important to believe Jesus is Lord is your salvation depends on it. Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10 says, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Your heart must believe it, Jesus is Lord. Your mouth has got to say it, Jesus is Lord, and your life's got to live it. Salvation isn't just, I'm sorry for my sins, Lord, and then you're saved. Salvation is turning towards Jesus and saying, Jesus, I believe that you are who you say you are. I believe what you've done for me on the cross and what you're going to do, you are Lord. Like, I believe that, and I'm going to live that out. I'm going to do my best to follow after you. It's a turning of our lives. That word repentance means turning away from and moving towards. And so your salvation depends on it to believe that Jesus is Lord, that he has that title. Does he have that title in your life? And the fourth reason it's important to believe is you get your worship right. You get your worship right. See, we have a tendency of worshiping things that aren't Lord. We have a tendency of of putting things... uh, higher than value in our lives than Jesus. And by definition, we're worshiping them. It's the thing that that consumes us. It's the thing that we can't do without in our lives. That becomes that idol. It becomes that small g God and becomes small l Lord in our lives. And we begin to worship that. There's a ton of stuff. I mean, material things, stuff, car, house, your clothes, more money in your account. You can even worship your kids or your spouse. You can worship your job, your accomplishments. You can worship your kids' accomplishments. There's a lot of things that we can hold as highest value, and we are worshiping that. But here's the thing. None of them are Lord. Have any of them come to the cross and died for your sins and raised again? None of them. There's only one true Lord, and that's Jesus Christ. And believing that Jesus is Lord, it sets our worship right. He alone is the only one who deserves all the honor and the glory and the praise. I mean, we meet every single week on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. to lift up the name of Jesus, to remind us that he is Lord. Because we can get distracted by all kinds of things, and the world goes, oh, well, this is important, and this is a value, and this could be worship, and this could be worship, but we need to realign our hearts, and when we believe it, man, we're setting our worship right. And you know what? That matters. Because when you start worshiping things that actually aren't Lord, they're going to let you down, right? Money runs out. Houses burn down. People move away. Positions can leave. Our own self, our bodies can fail. 
Those things cannot be worshipped because they don't hold the title that Jesus has. He is Lord. It sets our worship right. There's a quote I love by Darlene Check. She said this, We don't worship God because life is good. We worship God because he is good. Amen. Man. I just want to ask you in your own heart and mind today, do you believe that Jesus is Lord? Do you believe that that title is who he is and he backs it up with everything he's done and will do? In your life, in the life of others, in this world, Jesus is Lord. If you've never confessed that, if you've never acknowledged that, today can be a day where you say yes to Jesus and yes, I believe that you are Lord. Maybe you don't have it all figured out. Maybe you don't understand all of the Bible yet. You don't understand how it all comes together, but you know that you've been distant from God and you're missing something. And you recognize Jesus is what I'm missing because he's the one that has that title of Lord. I need a Lord in my life. I need one to set me straight, to help me, to move me in a direction that he's calling me to. Jesus does that. And if you want to ask Jesus into your life and you want to claim him as Lord, we want to pray for you this morning. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have everyone just bow your heads and close your eyes. And I know most of your stories, most of you have said yes to Jesus and you're calling on him as Lord, but there may be somebody here who has never made that decision and you know that today is a day of salvation for you and you want to ask Jesus into your life and follow him. If that's you, I want to pray for you this morning just so I know who we're praying for. If that's you, just put your hand up and say, Pastor Rex, I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior today. Anybody here want to pray that prayer? We'll pray with you. Just put your hand up. Now, I didn't see a hand go up, but we're still going to pray this prayer. This is for all of us, so just repeat this prayer after me from your hearts, if you would. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. I believe in you, Jesus, and I acknowledge that you are Lord. Thank you for saving me, and I'm sorry for the sin, but I thank you for your forgiveness. Help me as I follow after you. I give my life to you. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. We're not done here yet this morning, but if you gave your life to Jesus or you made a significant step in your life to Jesus, I would love to talk with you. We also have a prayer team that will be available after the baptism up front here. Come talk with them if you have a prayer need on your life, in your heart, something that is just man, you need, you need some prayer. We have people that believe in the power of prayer that can rally around you and pray with you. So take the opportunity after, um, at the end of the service to come up for that. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in to today's teaching at Pursuit Church. We pray that the teaching today will encourage your faith in Jesus Christ to draw you closer to him and give you a better understanding of his word. If there's a way that we can minister to you, pray for you, or encourage you in your faith, please reach out to us on our website, PursuitNazarene.org and click on connection card. Also, you can share this video with others and encourage them. Thank you and we'll see you next time.